And all right, today I'm with Mark Podolsky, the land geek. We're going to be talking all about, well, marketing, but we're also going to be talking about systematizing investment strategies and, and how all this stuff also relates to small business. So stay tuned. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So, if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So, be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. All right, everyone. I'm joined here with Mark Podolsky, the land geek. And Mark, you and I go way back, but it's been a long time since uh, I've had you on my show and since I've, I've been on your show. So why don't we just get a, a bit of an introduction so that uh, we can introduce, introduce you to people and let people know where you're coming from and, and, and a little bit about what you're about. Sure, sure. So if we rewind the tape to 2000, I was a miserable, micromanaged, 45-minute commute to work and back investment banker specializing in mergers and acquisitions with private equity groups. And David, it got so bad for me. I wouldn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around. I'd get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast and having to be <laughs> back at work on Monday. So my firm hires this guy and he's telling me that as a side hustle, he's buying up raw land pennies on the dollar at tax deed auctions. He's flipping them online and he's making a 300% return on his investment. And David, I'm looking at companies all day long. And a great company, great, has 15% EBITDA margins or free cash flow. Average company was 10%. I'm looking at companies all day long, less than 10%. So of course, I don't believe him. So we go to New Mexico. I've got three grand saved up for car repairs. I do exactly what he tells me to do. I buy 10 half acre parcels, an average price of $300 each. I flip them online. They all sell for an average price of $1,200 each, 300%. It worked. So I took all that money, went to another auction. And this is in Arizona where I live. And again, it's 2000. There's no one in the room. I'm yeah. buying up lots and acreage for nothing. And I flip all that money and I made over $90,000 cash. So I go to my wife. And she's pregnant at the time. I said, honey, I'm going to quit my job and become a full-time land investor. And she said, absolutely not. So I said, okay, okay, okay. So it took about 18 months for the land investing income to exceed the investment banking income. And then I've quit. Uh, I quit. I've been doing it full time ever since. I've done over 6,000 transactions uh, and growing, and I, I absolutely love it. So, everyone who tunes into my channel thinks that mergers and acquisitions is incredibly awesome. What was it about being in that industry that you found so stressful? What gave you the Friday blues? Well, mergers and acquisitions on your side of the table is awesome. Right when you're the middleman and you're you're looking at a six figure commission that could be derailed because the uh, CEO doesn't like the perk package that the private equity group gave up. I mean, you're talking about egos and, and just this complete lack of control. And talk about a long sales cycle. I mean, it's like an eighteen month sales. Well, cycle. okay, so 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 you were basically in in the broker role. You were you were trying to put the deals together. I was putting the deals together. I was yeah, I was yeah, working. Yeah. With the oh, I know group. all about yeah, the yeah. problems with that. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because I mean, I used to be a business broker in the Main Street space, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Like like just all these different things can happen to upset the deal. So all right, so now I understand. So you're you've you've found a new way to make money. And you and I first connected uh, like almost 10 years ago because when I wrote my first book, Invest Local, uh, back in yeah. 2014, um, basically the book is about the ways that you can invest and the ways that you can use the, the wonders of time, value of money, and basically doing the things that banks do in making loans and, and how you can conceptualize these rates of return. And, and you basically stumbled across a lot of these same sort of ideas in the world of, of the land. initially. 
you were just selling these parcels, these half acre parcels for cash terms, right? The people are just writing you a check for 1200 bucks. Yeah. So when I first started, it was just cash and okay, great. I've got cash, but I still had financial insecurity. It's like I had to start over every single time on a new deal. I thought, well, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And I thought, well, what if I own or finance it? Now I own the asset. And I'm getting payments over time. So because of time value of money, I get a higher price for the parcel. And if they default, I'm using a land sale contract. So the asset still remains in my name. There's no cost of foreclosure. They've just lowered my cost basis. I can do it again. You get a new down payment. You get a new monthly payment. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the antidote to financial insecurity. It's passive income. If I can get so, my passive income to exceed my fixed expenses, great. So, but I'm curious to know, you know, when you were selling on cash terms, if you said this half acre parcel is 1200 bucks, what, what then changed when you started to offer financing? In addition to collecting the interest, I bet you were probably able to sell the plots for more too, right? I was able to sell, I was able to sell them for more and I was able to increase my buyer pool because now I was making a car payment. So if you had a job, you could afford it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this is, this is one of the reasons why I, I, I wanted to have you come on today because it, in fact, this morning I was, um, I actually did a live presentation here locally for a group of, of new business startup entrepreneurs, local economic development office has me come in every once in a while to talk about sales and, and, and conversations related that particular to the businesses that, uh, that people want to start in the room. And one of the things that I often point out is that anyone who studies marketing, they learn about the, what is it? The five P's product, place, price, promotion, or maybe it's four P's. I don't know, but, yeah. but I'll often say to people that an important part of price that not many people think about is the method of payment and the terms. Because when you change, when you allow a method of payment that the customer prefers, or you allow terms of sale that make it easier for the customer, that can become a part of that pricing. And we see that every day when people are selling RVs, cars, anything expensive. And, and you found that out directly yourself when it came to selling this, this land. I would imagine that you know there's a lot of people out there that maybe don't own any property, but aspire to. And when they all of a sudden have a chance to buy a half acre plot of land and with a small monthly payment, uh, this is attractive. What what's the typical term uh, of the of the installment contracts that you sell on? It's probably about sixty months, maybe you know, between two forty nine and three twenty nine a month, a car payment. And and by installment contract, what we're saying is that you hold the title until the last payment's made. I hold the title, right? So there's a promissory note, a purchase sale agreement, and a land sale contract. They all say the same thing: make your payments. You're going to get to own the property. If you miss a payment, you've got 30 days to secure your, your default. Or you're, after 30 days, you're in default, and then you have 30 days to secure it. After that, we keep your down payment, we keep your monthly payments, and we just resell the property. And so there's a whole process to it, and we use software to automate it. So we use a software called geekpay.io. It's like the set it and forget it loan management system. So yeah. now it's I, I, don't, I don't even have to do the work of it, and it does all the math for me, and it's awesome. And, and so, you know, a lot of times when people are selling a business, they'll have to do some, some amount of seller financing. And I know it's a little bit different than, than, um, than when you're selling a piece of land, but, but there's a certain legal overhead to getting that seller financing in order. Like there's some of the contracts that the attorneys are putting together have to be paid for. And then maybe there's UCC or other security registrations that are made or, or what have you mortgages maybe are filed. And so there's, there's this, this overhead to getting the payment structure set up and put into place. And, and you avoid that with this methodology that you've worked out. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, let me just ask you then, uh, you know, how, what percentage of your customers that buy this land end up making all 60 of the payments? So great question. It depends on the market. Okay. So, you know, I've been doing this, for a long time. So if you remember 2008, 2009, not bad years for me. We're sort of on the long tail of real estate. So while residential and commercial were getting killed, 
land was doing just fine, but 2010, it caught up. And so it was like mm. one day, 50% of my notes defaulted uh, over time. And so wow. that was a huge hit for me. And I actually talk about that in, uh, in my book, Dirt Rich. But, you know, I had to figure out how to do that. Now, the company was still profitable because we have these, you know, really great profit margins and low overhead. But for me personally, it was a huge hit to my personal income. So, you know, today, in today's market, I would say we're about 12% at a default rate because we don't do credit checks. Um, okay. In a, you know, in a recession, that could jump to 20%. Uh, and then I would say that in a, in a really strong market, you know, let's say two years ago, maybe 10%, 8 to 10%. So it varies. What? what- what are most of these buyers using the land for? Would would I be? I mean, my assumption is that a lot of this is being used like recreational property, like people are going camping yeah, so we, and stuff like that. Yeah, so we got recreational people. We have people who want to eventually build there. We have legacy investors, um, and so you know, there's there's still like these these buckets of, of buyers, if you will. I would say most of the land that I'm selling, the the people are going to be they want to use it recreationally. And they like the idea of a legacy. This is the one thing in their life that is going to last. It's and it's just generational. So it's you know here's an asset you don't have to maintain, you don't have to protect, can't be destroyed, mm-hmm. and it lasts forever. Yeah, and and so I mean we're talking about like what what does this land? Look, I mean I I live in a very different place than uh, than Arizona, obviously. So what is this land typically looking like? Like is this like barren or forest or, or what? Yeah. I mean, it? It, yeah. I mean, there's a pig for every barn. Uh, you know, I've never been stuck with a piece of raw land. There's been land that, you know, you and I would not want to own, but there's someone out there that would want scrub brush in the middle of the desert. So at the right price, it all sells. But okay. I, I would say typically we're looking at land that's rural, uh, an hour to three hours from the nearest city. And, and so what create, I mean, obviously people think about real estate, a lot of people think about real estate as an investment, as a store of value that you can, uh, you know, if you need to, you can put a property up for sale. And so it sounds like there's, there's probably some reason why people don't just go and sell the properties on their own for the kind of values you get. Can you, can you describe sort of the people, the people who are selling the property to you? Is it, is it mostly people that just haven't paid taxes or, or how to, who are those? Yeah. People? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll walk you through the model. So, so sure. David, let's, let's assume that you live in, well, you're, you're in Canada, right? Yeah. And you yeah. can, as a Canadian, you can, you can own us land. So let's say you bought I already, some land. I do. Yeah. So, okay, great. So you got, you got us yeah. land. Let's say you've got some land where I live in Arizona and I get the tax roll and I say, Oh, there's David Barnett. He owes $200 in back taxes. He's in Canada. So you're advertising two important things to me. Number one, you have no emotional attachment to the raw land. And number two, you're distressed financially in some weird way because you didn't pay your property taxes. As a result, the county treasurer keeps sending you notices saying, David, you don't pay your property taxes. You're going to lose that property to a tax deed or a tax lien investor. So all I'm going to do is send you an actual offer on your property. So let's say that the comps... Let's say they, they range from ten thousand to forty thousand dollars on say a five acre parcel in Arizona. Well, I'm going to take the lowest comparable sale, ten thousand, and divide by four, and that's going to get me what Warren Buffett would call a three hundred percent margin of safety. So I'll send you an actual yeah. offer of twenty five hundred dollars. So now you accept it because why? For you, twenty five hundred dollars is better than nothing, and it eases your your tax burden. So, so, so basically, these people are so disinterested, typically, that they're they're willing to take a discount for the convenience of just not having to mess with anything. Hundred percent. It'd be like almost it, if I sent you an offer of twenty five cents a dollar for everything in your garage you're not using. You're like, great, take it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and so now, let's say you take that parcel, a bigger parcel of land. Are you going to then sell that as one parcel, or do you subdivide? It depends. I mean, I absolutely would love to subdivide if it's economically feasible too. So okay. we did a, a big deal in Tennessee. It was like 1600 acre deal. We subdivide it into 30 acre lots and we put in the roads and we do all that. 
that's a that's a definitely a more sophisticated strategy. I'd say that the majority of the time we're taking the actual parcel. And, you know, usually we're buying say 40 acres or less. So they're not really easy to subdivide in those cases. Mm. And we'll just flip it. And so we want to sell it 30 days or less. And, you know, we have a whole, say, marketing algorithm that we'll look at. So essentially, you know, first we want to market to the neighbors, right? Because they're right there. We already know they're interested in that land. And we'll send out a neighbor letter saying, hey, here's your opportunity. Protect your privacy. Protect your views. Know your neighbor. Right. So oftentimes the neighbors will buy it. Now, if they pass, we'll go to our buyer's list. If the buyer's list passes, we'll go to uh, a website like Meta or Facebook, buy, sell groups, the marketplace. And then we'll go to the lands, uh, land.com, landmoto.com, landandfarm.com, landsofamerica.com, landflip.com, landhub.com. These are platforms where people buy and sell raw land every day. But getting back to the beginning of our discussion, the the secret is that pricing. It, we just have to make it irresistible. And so if we can yeah. ask for a $2,500 down payment and then say a car payment of one ninety seven a month and 9% interest for the next 60 months, we get this one-time sale. We're going to get our capital out on the down payment. We could go six to 10 months out. And now we're getting 197 bucks a month, 9% interest for the next 60 months, no renters, no rehabs, no renovations or rodents. And so it's a simple game. Can we create enough land notes where our passive income exceeds our fixed expenses? And now we're working because we want to, not because we have to. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, when you when you think about the, you buy for one price, you're selling it on a note at a an interest rate of like 9%, right? But you're actually, your annualized rate of return is much higher because you're not selling it for what you paid for. You're selling it for a, a higher price. And so you've got, once you work it all in, I, I would imagine your your rate of return on that deal deal by deal basis is probably like more like 30 or 40% or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we get yields as high as 72%. Yeah. 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 And, and so you're also describing to me a business system because you know people would look at this and say it's an investment strategy, but you've turned it into your day-to-day -day business that you operate. And so uh, that piece of land, I mean, it, it almost reminds me of like a merchant with a store that has you know various articles of inventory in the store. That's kind of the way you're treating this, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just it's a it's a complete automated system with software and inexpensive virtual assistants that we just yeah. have operators working and in, in a team and it's just a machine. Well, what's the most expensive piece of land that you've purchased? Would it be that 1600 acres in Tennessee? Or was yeah. I mean, that, you know, usually it's a, maybe a million or 2 million over, over the okay. years. Yeah. So not, not crazy expensive. And that was raw land for a million dollars? That's raw land. Yeah. Okay. And so are, are those people even still afflicted by this problem of not paying their property taxes? No, those people typically are just, they're going to go to a realtor and they just want yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. And, and what, have you, have you had any problems? Like if someone defaulted on one of their contracts, like getting them off the property, if they were using it? Yeah, we haven't had that too many of those issues. Um, it, it can happen. Uh, you just have to contact a local attorney. The attorney then contacts the local sheriff and the sheriff then removes the person from the property. Okay. And, yeah. it, you know, I, like I used to own apartments. And yeah. so, you know, I was, especially when I first got into it and I was younger, I was managing them myself. So I was meeting prospective tenants and I was getting the leases signed and, and then if somebody, you know, I was collecting the checks and if something bounced or there was an issue or whatever, I was the one managing it. And that was one of the, one of the things that led to my decision to exit that field was just because I was tired of dealing with, with all the, what, what tenants, toilets and troubles or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Tenants, I know there's, toilets, termites, yeah. trash. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that's obviously one of the other things that's kind of nice about just dealing in the raw land, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really the, 
I think it's the best passive income model besides maybe insurance because insurance is a one-time sale. It's just an idea. You don't have to go out and buy anything, but mm. it's boring, right? People don't, it's a little bit more competitive, but um, besides that, I mean, I, I do think it's just a, a phenomenal passive income model, just shuffling paper. You don't have to have anything physical uh, to do. And because we're not, going out and physically looking at the properties ourselves, we can outsource that. And, and all of this, again, can be outsourced. Uh, the, my cost of due diligence is about 11 bucks in Jamaica. They're connected to an American title company. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about this process. Um, have you ever like do you hold all the all the contracts to maturity? You must if you if you still have the title of the land. I'm just wondering if you ever thought yes. about you know using that portfolio you know to like hypothecate like or, hypothecate or, the the, the loan yeah or, or or selling the loans or something like that. Have you ever explored? Yeah, those we things? we aren't a net seller of loans, but we like to buy them from people. Yeah, so we're <laughs> so we're a net buyer of them, but absolutely, if there was a, a need, let's say that. You know, we had a multi-million dollar deal and we didn't we didn't want to use other people's money. We absolutely could sell that note portfolio, you know, say fifty cents on dollar to another investor and and use that money to go other places. I, I would say what would be more interesting to me would be selling a partial. So I get two bites of the apple. So maybe yeah. twelve to eighteen months of the note portfolio and then have it get, take that cash, redeploy it, and then have that note portfolio revert back. Yeah. Back in, uh, back in 2018, I actually, I went to Vegas and I gave a talk at the paper source note convention and met a lot of people who were buyers and sellers of these, uh, uh, secondary, uh, market, uh, mortgages and deeds of trust and that kind of thing too. And, and so it reminds me of that, that that's really cool. Like, um, so typically, I mean, you, you have a book out that that talks about this process and you teach people how to do it. Who, what kind of person typically is getting involved with you? I mean, I think that the person that gets involved with me, number one, hates their job mm -hmm. and they want a way out. That's, that's usually a, a, a typical avatar. And they like the idea of sort of this headache-free idea of real estate. The other avatar was you, right? They own rentals. And they're tired of the headaches of the tenants and the toilets and the termites and the trash. And so they find that this is a much simpler model uh, to go for as well. And then there's just people that like land and they're like, well, yeah. wait, I, I can make money doing this as a business and then also find myself some cool land uh, to own. Yeah. So those are typically the, the, the people that, want to learn the land business. And I mean, is it, are there certain States that are better for this? You mentioned that, uh, you know, County, uh, you know, tax rolls sort of indicating who's behind and stuff. I know it, different jurisdictions must be different in how they, they present this information or whether to the degree of how public it is. Yeah. I mean, States are, are, you know, all have different legalities and different processes as well. But, you know, to your point, like, let's just be honest, like nobody wakes up and thinks to themselves, boy, like some raw land today in Iowa, unless you live yeah. in Iowa. So we want to focus on the sunshine states, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, uh, parts of California, maybe a little bit in the Northwest, uh, you know, let's say Oregon, Washington, Texas is a great market. Florida is a great market as well. And then parts of the Midwest, uh, as well that are that are heavily treed and and have some really beautiful rural areas. So yeah, there's there's gonna be those markets and that are that are gonna be uh, you know way more popular and may easier to sell. And like and you want to avoid environmental issues. You can go to like a site like epa.gov and make sure yeah. you're not buying in a super fun site or uh, you know a flood area. So there, there's a way to do that research with your due diligence. But if I'm buying in like say New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Ohio, these heavily Michigan, like heavily industrialized States, I'm more likely to run across 
something environmental on that land. So I just simplify it, just completely avoid it. I mean, there's billions of acres mm. of land available in the United States and you couldn't think of a more boring niche. So you're not going to go on HGTV or the DIY network and see flip this land. The before picture is raw land, the after picture is raw land. So it's it's a really nice little niche there. Well, and I know like, you know, you mentioned floodplains, like, um, like here where I live, we've got several rivers that typically flood in the spring when the snow melts. And, um, for a lot of those areas, you can't get building permits anymore just because the government doesn't want you to, you know, be building buildings in places prone to flood, but the land still holds value because people will buy it and just, they'll pull their RV there and they'll enjoy it for the summer. And then the fall, they, they pull it, you know, to higher land and, and get it out of the way sort of thing. So I, w- I would imagine sometimes it's just it would affect the value obviously of the property but it may still be something you could trade in couldn't you yeah absolutely i mean there's there's very few use cases in our niche where we're like oh wait that's not good land even yeah. swamp land you can grow shiitake mushrooms on so there's i a didn't know that i use. didn't know that's where they came from <laughs> yeah so there's a highest and best use for, for almost every parcel of land and I remember I did a deal in New Mexico. This is early, early on. And I'm out there with my buddy and we're looking at this property. And it was, it was, it was property that had gone to tax deed auction. And it was so ugly. Nobody even bought it for the back taxes. So then it goes what they call over the counter. And you can just buy the lots over the counter. And I think they were, they were acre lots and they were going for like 50 bucks a lot. And there's like 100 of them. So we're looking at the property, and to me, this area looks like Chernobyl. I mean, it was just so, like, just ugly. And my buddy's like, well, for 50 bucks a lot, why don't I, you know, buy it and, you know, someone will pay 100 bucks a lot for it. I'm like, dude, if you sell this property, two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to get refunds. Or number two, they're going to be so disappointed with it, they're going to they're gonna sue you, right? So he's like, ah, I, you know, I don't know. He's like, you sure you don't want to split this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I won't be able to sleep at night knowing that I'm selling this land. So he takes all hundred lots and starts flipping them online. And he sends me an email of each sale. And he's selling them for like a thousand bucks a lot. That's what they're going for. And I would re email him back. I'm like refund. He'd email me another sale. I'd like, I read email back refund slash lawsuit. This goes on. He sells out. Guess how many refunds he had? I don't know. Did he have any? zero? No, Did any no people refunds. go visit. No, they didn't care. So it was about a $50,000 mistake that I learned that I'm not the buyer and of these, of these land, of this lot, of these lands, right? And not to be a land snob, there really is a pig for every barn. Well, I think it, it was it Malcolm Forbes that once traded in land and he, he sold yeah. really tiny acres in a yeah. Western state, Montana or Colorado. Yeah, or he something. had Forbes Ranch in Colorado. I mean, he made millions on that. It, it, the, and the I've looked. Whole, at, I've looked at that property. Yeah. It wasn't great. From from what I understand of the story, the whole the whole marketing uh, thing that he achieved was just that at at the time there were a lot of people, urban dwellers in big eastern cities, that sort of liked the idea of knowing that they owned a piece of you know the frontier land, right? That that they could say to people at parties that they had you know. Uh, land out in uh, in the west somewhere, and and that this was one of the driving things. And he and I believe he did the same thing. He offered finance plans, so that so that it would be very affordable for people. Um, that that's really interesting. I, around here, when people don't pay their taxes, eventually they end up going to this tax auction. And uh, I've looked at property before in the tax auction, and we have an online system uh, put up by the government where you can look up PIDs and uh, and you know see drawings of where they are but one of the thing that i one of the things i notice is that a lot of these plots that go up for tax sale um they don't have road frontage they're like landlocked isolated kind of properties is that something that you look out for when you're doing your due diligence yeah we absolutely do so you yeah. we, we want to make sure that our customer can actually access the property so that's going to be part of the due diligence hmm. okay cool um I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, any particularly interesting stories you want to share or um, you, you shared quite a bit? Like, is there anything else we haven't covered yet here, Mark? I mean, I, I think, you know, if I'm listening to this and I'm skeptical, right? Like if Mark, like Mark, like if it's so great, 
why would you tell anybody about it? And so I think that's a fair question. And so, you know, I was doing it from 2001 to 2011 full time. And this guy calls me one day and says, Hey, will you teach me how to do what you're doing? And I said, well, I don't, I don't really teach it. He's like, well, if I pay you this, I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll teach you. And then I go to my wife and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to teach this, this guy how to, how to do the land business. She's like, well, why would you do that? Why would you create your own competition? I said, well, that's a good point. So let's put on our investment banker hat or a venture capital hat and say, well, how big is the market? And so the market's massive. You, me, a million people could be in this niche. We'll all run out of money before we run out of deal flow. And so for me, it's been so gratifying to be able to talk to people that said, hey, I was able to quit my job. I was able to retire my spouse so she could spend more time with the family. Um, and it's just been life changing for so many people and so many people's families. It's been the most gratifying thing I've done professionally. So yeah, I love to buy and sell land, but it really only benefits sort of me and my customer. Like the customers are calling me up and saying, hey, Mark, you changed my life with this piece of raw land. They like it, but it's not life-changing. But once you help somebody create enough passive income where it exceeds their fixed expenses and they can move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs into self-actualization, mm. that's that's really powerful. Well, and and you know, it's interesting because uh, you're doing this with land. You're buying low, selling higher with payment plans that allow you to find a broader market. Um, that, I mean, that's what the reason we originally connected was when I wrote this book, Invest Local, because I've met through email a couple hundred people who've read this probably at least. And and I describe in this book how you do that exact business plan with other things, delivery yeah. vans, welding equipment, like you you buy it, you you lease it out or you put it on a payment plan or um, you you buy low and sell high and then do the same thing like what you're doing. I mean, th this is not a revolutionary or new business model. It's just, it, it's a realization that you can create value for someone through the, the payment methodology and the payment plan. And so at, to your point, like when you make it more easier for somebody to afford to make the payment, you broaden the market, you, you bring the, the item to more people. Um, and that can create an opportunity for someone that has a bit of liquidity who can, who can sort of um, act as that middleman and grease the wheels between the people that want to get out of something and the, and the people who would like to have it, but maybe can't write a check for the full amount. No, absolutely. And, you know, to, to make the pricing delightful is delightful for those customers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you shared a link with me. Uh, I'm going to put it in the notes. You want to let people know what they can get if they go to that link? Yeah. So um, we were talking about the book I wrote, Dirt Rich. I've got a new one coming out pretty soon, Dirt Rich 2, The Plot Thickens, How to Scale Your Land Business. But that's coming out in a few months. But this is just sort of an overview of the land business. Um, in the link, it's it's a free book. Uh, you just pay for the shipping and you can kind of go deeper into the model and see if it resonates with you. Yeah. Well, I think it's cool. And um, and I want to thank you for coming over and talking with us today. Just I think uh, it's been a long time since I've, I've had sort of a invest local kind of conversation on my channel. But I think that when you start to think about these things, you can apply this lesson to almost every kind of business out there. Um, I've, I've, I've made suggestions to people over the course of the years about how they could use this kind of thinking to enhance a business. Like I remember, um, you know, I was once giving advice to a, a painting contractor and, and I was saying like a lot of the people who need painting services would be like apartment owners, for example, and apartment owners all have their revenue on a monthly cycle with the rent. But when they need the painting done is usually the month when that apartment is empty. So in that month, not only are they not collecting rent from that apartment, but now they've got a bunch of expenses for fixing it up for the next person, like doing the painting. So I said to this painter, I'm like, why don't you offer two prices? Offer, you know, I'll paint the apartment for a thousand bucks, or you can pay me a hundred dollars a month for 12 months, right? It, it would be an easy way for you to earn 20% more money. But some of those landlords might be like, hey, 
you know what? Now paying for the renovation is going to match the cash flow of my revenue here. They would probably take you up on it. They would see how you were delivering more value by being willing to do that kind of payment plan. And uh, yeah, he never implemented it, but it's probably because I didn't charge him for the advice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you don't pay, you don't, you don't pay attention, but you know, to your point, like, okay, what, what happens when the apartment owner stops paying? What, what recourse does he have? Well, I mean, in the case of someone like a painter, like you could very easily put a mechanics lien on a property, right? Okay. If, if somebody go. doesn't stick to the terms of the contract. So, um, you know, your point about security is a good one. Um, that's one of the things you have to think through when you're going to do something like this is, is the what ifs. Uh, and, and so kudos to you for, for, you know, creating your, uh, your, is it an installment sale contract? Is that what it's called? It's an installment sale contract. Yes. Yeah. 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 It makes good sense. Awesome. All right. So we got a link down below and then you have a, you have a show of your own too, don't you? Yeah. In fact, David came on and, uh, it was amazing. Uh, if you're listening to this, you'll, you, you know, you just know you feel smarter after you talk to David, but I ask really good questions of him. So my podcast is the art of passive income podcast. And, uh, we have guests like, uh, experts like David, and then we talk about a pain point in the land business in our round table podcasts. Um, so there's a lot of fun. Cool. So if, if this interests you, check it out. Um, and I want to thank you again, Mark. Thanks for coming over. David C. Barnett, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.